Right. So, uh, we are ready for the keynote. I probably should move more closer to the mic that everybody can hear me. So we are ready for the keynote. And it is my really, really, really great pleasure to introduce Moti Young. I think everyone who is in the security community knows Moti in one way or the other. Uh, I have, I have, he, he provided me a bio and it's, it's very modest for, for all of the things he did. He's currently working in the security and privacy uh, team at Google. Um, he, he got his PhD from Columbia University, uh, then started his career, I think, at IBM, moved through a company, a number of companies. I think I first came across him when he was working for RSA, uh, then went to Google, went briefly to Snap, went back to Google. Um, he received very many awards, uh, the IEEE Computer Society 2021 Computer Pioneer Award, the 28W Wallace McDowell Award, and this is very important. In 2014, he received the ACM SIGSEC Outstanding Innovation Award, and if you have been at that uh, uh, event, it, uh, uh, he presented actually that he established uh, the first uh, business use of private set intersection and multi-party computation at Google back then. And this is a real milestone uh, for all cryptographers that these technologies are actually being used in practice. And I know that Moti has a whole bunch of surprises for us today, I'm sure. And I'm sure that there will be another set of uh, very interesting technologies that Moti uh, uh, brought about. And I'm really glad he, he shares those with us. Um, he also received the Isorix Outstanding Research Award and gave in 2010 an ICSR Distinguished Lecture. He's a fellow of ACM, IEEE, ICR, EATCS, and uh, an interesting tidbit of, of his bio is that he has more co-authors than uh, days in a year. So uh, uh, he probably has more co-authors than people have registered here uh, for the PETS conference. Um, so this gives you a, an idea of how long Moti is in, in this game, and we are really glad to have him. So uh, with further, further ado, uh, Moti, please... Uh, uh, start, you can start your keynote. Thank you very much. Welcome, Moti. Thank, Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Do you hear me? Do you see the slides? Yep, loud and clear. Do you see the slides moving? We see the first page still. Still the first page. Do you see the second page now? No, unfortunately. Hmm. A second. Uh, okay, okay, now you should see. Have you moved slide, you see? Um, no, we can't see anything currently. Hmm. So same, same steps as before. The bottom left corner, there's a little screen icon. Click that, probably share your display instead of just the PowerPoint. Mm, one second. Uh, I do a screen share again. Yep, we can see the PSS research rule, it is changing. Yeah, it is changing. Okay, great. So, uh, first time I use this system and uh, it's fun. So, I will talk today about privacy integrated computing cryptographic protocols in practice. And this is joint work with uh, people in Google PSS, privacy, security, and safety research and the Google research teams and other people sometimes, but mainly people uh, uh, in industry. Uh, PSS is a newly reorganized research group dealing with privacy, security, and anti-abuse in, in Google to support the uh, PSS group, uh, which is the, essentially the security engineering teams in the company. So the agenda. 
I will start by characterizing the typical computing uh, situation nowadays. I would then demonstrate that such computing uh, nowadays is needed of uh, privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, this will be concrete industrial projects uh, of leading companies that are moving like Google in similar directions. I will point at uh, what I think made this project successful and how following some principles, like I'm mentioning, can help uh, the industry and also help technology transfer in general. My goal is not to show you my uh, more recent and fresh uh, and, uh, research and uh, show a lot of muscles of cryptographic uh, uh, technologies, but, but rather to draw conclusions of what works in, in, in uh, practice and why. And uh, this project and uh, other projects by other people, I think we will set the direction of privacy in the coming future. And this was this is the important one, the important outcome of uh, of the of this talk. It will be more like conclusion drawing based on technologies and based on some technologies, even though. The, these technologies that are presented in the past, but the, the perspective of uh, post uh, deployment and post successful deployment and extensions will be very important, I think, to this community. After all, we are talking about uh, a success of, of, of basic uh, research agenda that is the core of, of this conference. So computing in the last 50 years, <laughs> I, uh, to typify it, I, I, uh, I went to, to see the vision of uh, Doug Engelberg. Um, he viewed computing as an extension of human activities. He's a Turing Award winner. He's known uh, colloquially, but he's done more than inventing the mouse, which is a very important uh, interactive tool for, for uh, computing. But he characterized computing, uh, the goal of computing, boosting mankind's capability for coping with complex and urgent problems and later on said uh, augmenting society's collective IQ. So helping humanity coping with emerging complex issues is a big part of uh, the foundations of computer science have to do. And this is its uh, outer facing challenges when facing users and facing other fields, facing other areas of, of uh, what humans are doing. And, uh, and we can see it, we can see it when we uh, analyze the, uh, how computing and humans are getting closer and closer in some sense. Uh, in the 80s, there was the PC revolution. So suddenly people got uh, a desktop and they could uh, use it in their office or in their home office. And uh, we saw many of the, of the functions that used to be on the office desk moving into the PC, like printers. And uh, then came the internet. Suddenly there is global reach. People get their news, their mail, their social interactions and uh, buying and uh, shopping and uh, publishing and you can do it and then we we saw the mobile computing ubiquity everywhere you go you have a computer with a smart computer in your hand in the last 10 years or so your 
your wallet is now in, well, in, while computing, maps, uh, car rides, and so on. It's all in your pocket and it's a computer. And then came cloud, which uh, gives you vast, uh, flexible, elastic resources as you need. And we see the IoT coming, devices everywhere. And, uh, and, uh, and now uh, you, you control everything with uh, computing. So indeed, computing has become uh, uh, a human reality and, and, and serves human needs very well. So Angelbart's uh, vision is really in full uh, swing. And uh, the, we cannot envision human experience in modern life. Or, or we can almost not do it without a computer. I mean, it doesn't mean that we take breaks and, and go and, and go hiking in the woods. But in general, for the long run, we need, we need uh, to interact somewhat with computers. So, so computing, computing is about people, it's with people, but I quote Yogi Berra here, who said a lot of uh, interesting things, uh, contradicting things, but he said if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. He said it, he didn't even understand self-reference, but he said it anyway. He's known for such things. And what do I mean by this? Where is the imperfect situation? So as individuals are served, uh, their data is necessarily being used. So somehow uh, there is an exposure. And this immediately uh, assures that privacy is part of what computing needs, because as you share your data, you don't mean to share it uh, with everyone. You don't mean uh, that uh, your privacy needs to be violated. So as we, as, as, as computers and humans get together, obviously human data is used and privacy pops up naturally. And this happened to be my thought in 2007, as I joined Google. At that time, many in the security community thought that crypto research is over because they had SSL. So it's all done. Everything they needed for secure internet was there. There was SSL. There was AES. There was MD5. Never mind, it was later broken. And there was RSA, so they could do everything. And, and Web 1.0 was uh, very successful. It became the center of the universe. And uh, 2007, I, 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 I still remember myself thinking, the game is just beginning. Many challenges are around, and technology is bound to change soon. And, and, and privacy was one of the main motivation due to already that uh, human and computing are together, and data is, is in the mix, and I don't want to give away. All right. So uh, I don't know, I called it at some point privately integrated computing thesis, and uh, many people contributed uh, many ideas to, to this uh, thesis. The, 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 short, the short way to think about for this community is that privacy should be built in wherever possible. And now I think perhaps beyond privacy by design, Privacy is, is something that should be maybe part of this, even the specification. You deal with data, and the data has to be characterized somehow. So it's not necessarily that it's just you add privacy, enhance with privacy the design. You may even, in the specification, uh, qualify 
which data and what data and who gets what. And it's perhaps uh, beyond practical by legal requirement, which was one of the originating motivation for privacy, because privacy is a technical uh, built in regardless of the current law. The law can change. So, as I say, think about privacy from the start. And it's actually easier than retrofitting privacy. It's the same thing of uh, thinking about security. If you want to build a system based on data and you design certain uh, blueprint and principles and partially implementing the specification uh, goals of privacy, it's much better to retain privacy and extend privacy than if you build it without privacy and then you have to take care of privacy. Same, same as principle that is well recognized in security research. Obviously, law, policy, etc. are important. Uh, any modern computer scientist who works in practice has to interact with uh, the these fields and, and similar and similar fields because of the again this is because you human activity and computing are becoming uh, are overlapping and all becoming uh, the same uh, of course but in this talk I will not stress law and policy I have other talks for it. One thing I want to say is that we may not get to the privacy integrated computing in one shot. We may need to iterate, we may need to trade it against utility. But the goal of modern human centric uh, computing should include uh, privacy. And uh, what I want to show you today is some good news about privacy and the current wisdom of uh, people I interact with. So people believe now that computing is about big data and we, not always, in many situations we don't, do not need uh, individual data. And the industry started to attempt to keep uh, user data privacy while working only on aggregate, it is considered sometimes liability to keep too much information. Uh, user, sometimes to server, the data sharing is reasonable because the user wants some task to be done at the server. But collecting data about the users from anywhere it is on the internet and when it is not authorized by the user and it's not something uh, that the user expects and it's something that is there by accident just because of uh, cookies being uh, the way to keep state when a user uh, gets an internet uh, is now uh, people start to think it's not uh, warranted. Uh, when we need only limited information on an individual, there's no need to carry all their data. Uh, as I said, it's potentially increased liability. And uh, some people think, you know, we, we, we need the individual data only on a need to know basis. And I will try to demonstrate this type of thinking and implications in, in, uh, in the te techniques that I will uh, uh, present. So the example, uh, the first example that I will uh, talk about it will be the continuation of the 2015 uh, uh, talk that I gave in uh, CCS about this technology that uh, was ma mentioned by Florian. But I, 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 uh, uh, finally, we took the theory of secure computation and put it in a big company for um, daily routine and important task. And I use it to 
to draw some uh, some perspective first how it evolved over the years and how uh, what are the principles that allow this uh, uh, success and how important it is to have the first success. Uh, so, so I have a slide here which uh, says secure computing, why now? So the internet uh, e electronic business is a multi-company cooperation, co cooperation between different corporations. And uh, these days people talk about uh, machine learning with uh, data from different sources. Uh, now we have cloud which hosts data and the users may not want to give all their data to the, uh, to the cloud in, 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 in plain text form. And we have Internet of Things, small devices. Um, that uh, you need uh, for help, but they are very personal and they may reveal things about the user. So, so they are existing and coming. Uh, uh, technologies that really, really demand this, uh, this uh, secure computing or, 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 or uh, privacy enhancement. And um, the, 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 the first thing with internet uh, e-business being multi-companies multi who hold the data about users was my first motivation, but, uh, but all, of the, all of the bullets above at the top of the slide, uh, apply now. And uh, to many of these uh, situations, other alternatives uh, which do not include secure computing as a component, at least, uh, don't work. And privacy enhancement and cryptographic protocols uh, are now over 40 years in existence. And we have uh, we have uh, packages that run it and, 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 and so on and cryptography that is uh, more or less at least more debugged in, in past and uh, which used to be possible. So when I when I uh, started it. Uh, just, just as an innovation, as a social and tactical choice, I wanted to employ privacy enhancement to offline computation. Uh, I had cryptographic solution in mind, and cryptography requires some overhead, but at least for the initial demonstration, offline is fine and can, can tolerate some BXC. It was important that it will be an essential task critical to the company because I didn't want just to solve a problem. I wanted to change minds that uh, privacy can be achieved. Uh, privacy restrictions do not necessarily uh, impair computations. And you need to have a group of uh, experts working in this area. I chose to concentrate on various uh, cases of uh, sharing data from different companies, sharing user data from different companies where uh, privacy concerns are, are apply and privacy and sharing restrictions are more seriously. And it's very important, this last bullet, that alternatives are all bad. That you cannot, you can, if you want to compute it in a way that is different than by a cryptographic protocol, something will suffer. You will have, you will have uh, points of potential points of failures or potential points of leakage. Whereas with the cryptographic protocol, you will get kind of end-to-end -end security in the sense that as long as a party 
holds uh, its cryptographic keys secure, then its data doesn't matter if it travels through the protocol through other uh, parties. Once the, you believe that the cryptographic key chosen by this party is secure and kept secure, then the data is kept secure. So that was important. And indeed, the setting is multi-company, uh, which determines wide area network protocol with a long, uh, long communication. So communication minimization becomes uh, first concern. And then uh, you don't want too demanding competitions either because uh, first of all, uh, it will uh, cause too much delays and you may want to adapt it to other scenarios from the first solution. That was already a goal that the, so the solution is adaptive. Therefore, design for possible extension, flexible component, multi-use, and things like this. And this gave rise to the private intersection sum problem. You probably saw it in the past. Uh, but it is good to see it again and get some perspective and see what was done based on the initial success. Because if you cannot, you cannot uh, in, in privacy technology, you cannot uh, have a general enough solution. You cannot have specific solution for anything. You have to have a general enough solution that you can easily adapt for, for other things. And I will demonstrate this point in this. So computer-driven encryption, due to the fact that we need to minimize communication, I looked at a private set intersection based on computer encryption, which uh, was designed by Polig and Elman in 76, this before RSA, exponentiate uh, the cipher, and the exponent is the private key, and M to the P, M to the E1, mod P, this is the encryption, and uh, Turn out, as we know, exponentiation is commutative, and therefore these ciphers, once run in the same group, are commutative. So m to the e1 to the e2 is m to the e2 to the e1, and mod p, so fg is gf, these are commutative encryption. The order of exponentiation is not important. And this, this was noticed by Shamir in iCalc 80 that you can run using it secretly an equality protocol. And uh, nowadays, of course, we can do it over elliptic curves and we can prove its security, which is uh, DDH. Therefore, sometimes people call this method the Diffie-Hellman method. And uh, sometimes we use it only in the encryption uh, side to, to find that ME2E1 equal ME1E2. And that's like a commutative joint hash rather than encryption because we don't use the encryption. Sometimes people call it, uh, and this is one of the examples of what is known as oblivious PRF. These are modern, more modern uh, terminologies for this. But it's really, when I needed it, I had to go back to 1980, ICALC, which is not a typical conference where, where cryptography is being presented. I needed, I, I needed to be at my age to remember that this, this technique actually exists. And uh, so based on this uh, cognitive encryption, we can do uh, privacy preserving uh, or private set intersection between G and M. G has a small G commutative encryption. M has F uh, 
and then G takes its set of users, let's call them users, G1 to Gn, and encrypt them, en encrypt them with uh, its encryptor G, send a list to M, M takes the, the this singly encrypted uh, list that was sent in one and doubly encrypted with its own encryptor F, so you get FG of G1 and so on, send it back to G in random order and send it takes its own set of users M1 to M sub M and applies its encryptor F to this list, send it to G, and then G can apply, take the singly encrypted uh, list coming from M, apply G to it, and then check the doubly encrypted list of himself to that of, uh, of, of doubly encryption list from M, and then uh, find how many, how many elements are in the interact. In the intersection. So this gives the set size, uh, and this is due to the random order on step two of the doubly encrypted list. But uh, you can keep two birds with one stone here. If if the initial list is sent to G in the original order without random order, then G can find the location of the doubly encrypted list, uh, you can uh, map those locations to the original element. So if FG uh, of G1, the list, he knows that the first element is in the list. So this is a, a symbol as you see that it's linear in the, in the, two, the, the communication is linear in two sets and that was the, the, the reason to go, to go there to this old, old thing. It's also something that is easy to explain. And to get a complete solution of what we need, uh, this intersection sum, we need a combination of commutative function-based PSI with something simple protocol called blinded sum that is also easy to explain. And, uh, and then it gave us a uh, very communication efficient, uh, scalable, and uh, with parallelism protocol, um, given optimization in the right parameters is important. The protocol is again between G and M. We add to M another encryptor, which was the Payet encryption that M generated, and then we can, we can run the complete solution, the private intersection sum, in which uh, the first part is running the G send its list, M, so now G, G is Google, and has a list of users who watch certain content, and uh, M has a list of users who spend money, M1 spent his S1. So Google sent its list of user encrypted, M doubly encrypted and permute this list, so G, F, G of G1 and so on. And then M sends its list of users, F of M1, but it attaches a, a, a Payet encryption of the spend of E1. And at the end, G encrypt, doubly encrypts these elements from the M list, find the intersection by finding matches between F, G, F of E1 and F, G of M, I. And then it can pick all the second component of those elements that are in common in these two lists because uh, the, sec the list from M carries as a tag by encryption of the spend value, so it can take it if it's in the intersection, multiply all these elements, multiply with random elements, 
get, get a number, send it back to M, who has the trap door, M encrypts, it doesn't learn anything because R is random and big, and, and uh, statistically hides the sum of that I, it gets back the clear text, which is R plus S1, and SIs that are for elements in the inter intersection. And uh, of course, uh, it can subtract R and find the spend. And these calculations of how many people, how many people are joined and how much they spend on the average is uh, joined people is very important for uh, organizing this content campaign. Content being uh, advertisement, coupons, and, and other, other, other possible tools. But the main, thing, the main thing is that nobody learns any individual element. G only learns how many are in the intersection and how much they spend in total. Of course, they reveal some upper bound because they can pad it with nonsense. On, on, on the size of the original lists of G of M, which are more or less anyway known. So what happened with, uh, with these solutions? So first of all, we did analytics of e-commerce between two com commercial entities, keeping all user data secure. And then once the first group implemented it, and it was known that they can don't do it otherwise, it was implemented in a number of cases. And variations of the protocol were implemented. This protocol is just one variant. The other variants split. And this runs routinely and brings uh, analytics based on aggregate data. And it's really now in various systems. Uh, for example, you heard about Google password checking, where you want to know if your password is in a list of compromise, is in a in a list of compromised passwords. So the technology to do this is also based on the private set intersection in the sense that you can compute if your password is in the list without learning the list and without the other side learning what you found because you can find it locally. So uh, you see that, that uh, this, is, this is, again, it's kind of offline computation. It's not really real time, but it serves users. This was then open source as, as uh, something that we call the join and compute, because you can think about intersection as a join in database and the sum computation. And then it was adopted for other other things, but uh, Facebook extended it to bridging identities, something that they were doing uh, previously in an in, in insecure way, in an insecure way. And uh, we extended it to malicious parties, which required theoretical work, and, 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 and we published it in crypto. So this was, we had a practical protocol based on the parties being uh, honest. And, and we, we extend the, the, the protocol on, uh, in a methodology that keeps the footprint of the, of the honest parties to the malicious parties. And this way you gain efficiency in the malicious part. And, uh, as, As a result of, of and, and uh, things, so things went beyond just Google. Google. Uh, I think at least the big companies like Google, uh, Meta, and, and other companies are now considering uh, privacy enhancement as uh, central to their business, and we hope to give more. And, uh, in, 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 in this domain of, of protocols like this. And in the future, I'll be able to talk about uh, what we work now on. 
And uh, the sentiments of 2007, that is the end of crypto research, is, is now, with a historical uh, perspective, somewhat uh, laughable. And, uh, you know, it was, I think, the end of crypto research was uh, promoted uh, from a point of view of self-interest of people who wanted to say that their research is more important than crypto research. Uh, but that's not that's the way to be to be right uh, in the future. If you want to be right in the future, analyze the situation. Try to analyze where the future of computing is gone. And then predict. Don't predict. Uh, don't predict to to your research pocket. Uh, trying to uh, convince uh, funding agencies to give you money and not to others. But you know, people uh, with the the, the the history punishes those people. I don't. Uh, I don't want to say more about it. But definitely. The thought that uh, the, the game just is just starting was more correct than those that thought that it's the end of crypto. Private computing groups with cryptographers and crypto engineers has become a reality in the industry. And also, by the way, uh, our research showing the practicality of PSI, for example, gave a boost to PSI research, and I think we're going to show see it. In the next session, it's another reason that motivated me to, to talk about uh, this perspective. I mean, the, the, what's nice is that this initial protocol and variants of are such that the components of them were uh, adapted and used for set intersection for. Uh, uh, some intersection for size interse intersection size and so on uh, for various applications and once people saw the first uh, the first uh, system working and solving a problem that was considered impossible before they wanted it. And uh, what is the secret sauce or the takeaway from, or from this? When you solve the fundamental industry issue, deployment will materialize. But things take time. You need, you need patience sometimes. But if you know that you are fundamentally correct and everybody else is, is wrong, and you do it in the right way, just looking at your technology, Maybe there are other technologies, and I will talk more about uh, combining technologies in the sequel. If you do it right, you will deploy. And to do this, to be to, to know that you are working on a fundamental issue, you have to work closely with business, with engineering, and be mindful of needs. <coughs> Another takeaway is that you have to be opportunistic. I mean opportunistic in the positive sense. Which means deploy now, but you as the designer of the security and, and, and privacy solution think about extensions. And why, why is that? Nobody, nobody builds a... Uh, applications just to do privacy. They want other applications. So you have to be ready for demands of those applications. The fact that I knew that the first protocol did the sum and the intersection size, but it could also do that intersection, meant that when they wanted to do password check, which was intersection between a singleton group and a larger group, they can essentially use the same protocol. And this is very important. You don't have to tell anybody that, that you designed it like this. The need will show up according to your best estimates, and then you're ready. It's much better. 
It's much better than designing a solution to problem A, and then they come to you with a problem B, and you say you are not ready, you need to, to start research now. It's much better to have it already in software, tweaking an existing software and getting the solution. It's very important in, in the industry. So be opportunistic. It, if it doesn't cost you a lot, add hooks for future extensions as you see them. Always have to think about the future. You can, you can never ride on the current success. The success is what comes next. And that was the important with this protocol, how we move to, to serve other protocols. In particular, password checking is, is, is an example of uh, private set intersection. You have to adapt and know the cryptographic tools to other system requirements. You, get, you gain momentum and you get more users and you get more good name within the company. Talking now to engineers and scientists who work in industry. Be mindful of performance and system constraint and educate the makers in a smart way. Tell them how we solve the problem. They understand much better performance than they understand cryptography. So if you can tell them the performance number up front when you when you run your your uh, benchmarks to yourself, it's much better. You are much you are on a much solid ground if you know those numbers. Know your organization's unsolved issues. Don't let them don't you know when we treat when we have a research problem sometimes we go, we go to to sleep, we go to bed and we are still thinking about them, how to solve them. So the same thing with the industrial problem. They have to hunt, they have to haunt you. And uh, another thing which the bullet before us, I say crypto is elegant on paper, but in the overall system context, it is like security technology. It's, it has messy components. It uh, has... Uh, uh, other works that need to be done to make it real. And the final bullet is very, very for, for security and crypto technologies. It's the foot at the door principle. Get an initial significant success, the rest will follow. This is very important. Work hard on the foot at the door principles. And then if you, if you are opportunistic and you see the future, you will gain more success with the same or two or similar or tweaked technology solving similar problems and 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 uh, gaining momentum so these are important principles and, and this is why it was successful in the beginning and this is why it is still successful in gaining new applications okay Oh, we had publications in 2020 on this, but you know the publications just just followed, and they were like the, the, the tip of the iceberg of, of all the work that was needed to 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 get it done and get it done right and get the extension and and, and popularize it and work on it inside the company, publicize it right, deal with the press that could not even describe it. Uh, Carefully, and so on. So my uh, second example. So I switch gear and I talk about the issue of separating access from identity. And the issue is that uh, Google One VPN was offered by Google for Android users. And the press reaction was laughing. Google now will track you there into your VPN. But the technical thing working on the on the Google One VPN claimed it ain't necessarily so. So quoting the Gershwin brothers. So what happened? 
So VPN typically is like you, on the top you see unsecured connection to a website from the users, the user can be, can be tracked, you know that this user and its uh, IP address and so on are, are known to the website. And uh, on the top, uh, the internet provider knows things, and, 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 and then there is the VPN connection in, win, in which the user has an encrypted tunnel to the VPN provider. So there are many users with encrypted title, uh, tunnels to the VPN providers. And then there is a connection to the web, so you can think about it as, uh, as the VPN masking the user from, from, from the website, and, and, and there is a crowd of users, and you don't know who accessed what. Uh, essentially, the VPN provider hides the user, and, and the press claimed, you know, user, Google is not fit to be the, 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 the masking element uh, uh, for users uh, against the, the, the website uh, behavior and so on. But, uh, but the technical team um, thought about a new, a new architecture for VPN that will decouple uh, the VPN provision from the knowledge of uh, identity. And the idea is something like this. First, the, Google, the user used its uh, Google credentials and a blinded token to go to a Google authentication service. As a result, it gets a, a blinded token signed by this service. And this, this is property in which the authentication service uh, send you a blinded token. And then the, the VPN clients on, at the front end of the user uh, unblind this blinded token signature and, and, and this unblinded signed token to a key management service that gives it uh, the public data and 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 and, uh, and now and now the the service the service is is is, is taking place through the VPN tunnel, but 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 uh, but the authentication is done at this stage, and, and at this stage it's without authentication because the authentication rely on the unblind unblinded token and, and the unblinded signature on, on, on the token. So this is the model. And the, the, initial, the initial deployment of the anonymous token was the old blind signing, employing the blind signature tool in which the user sent uh, a hash of the token times a random value to the Encryption exponent E, the server signed it, which is taking Y to D, which is age of the token to the D times the random to the E to the D, which is just random. And this is the blind signature. And the user unblinds because it no, it chose random, so it takes this this top this value and divides it, so to speak, with the random and gets uh, a signature on the token. This is to remind you blind signature, RSA blind signature, the first one that was uh, proposed by Xiaomi and used by Xiaomi Fiat Nao to, to implement offline, offline coins. It is one of the, it's perhaps the earliest uh, privacy preserving or privacy enhancing uh, protocols involving uh, three parties, the user and the authority the signs and then the, 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 the spending of, 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 of the token. These days we have developed uh, a few extensions in the talk on, on this subject, I will, I will talk about it. 
I could have presented experimental scenarios. Other people in the company work on other tokens and other token scenarios, which, is, which are very nice. And the area of anonymous token in various other scenarios is uh, really picking up in, in the industry for, for really various uh, access scenarios in which you want to decouple the identity from the authorization to access. And I think it's a very important tool and it, it, its time has come up due to, to, to the need to allow users to essentially hide in the crowd for certain services and not learning their exact pattern of access and which resources they access and things like this, which is an important part of user privacy. And what's the secret uh, sauce here, you know? First of all, all tools never die. And new applications may be dead. And the need for crypto tools may originate from other needs. In this sense, uh, the fact that, the user itself, that Google itself wanted to play the, the, the VPN, uh, VPN tunnel provider and we could not do it while hiding uh, the user identity directly and we need an indirect access. And, and another, another take is that privacy enhancing technologies like blind signature plus the suitable architecture equals improved privacy. It's never the protocol alone, but within the right architecture, it's demonstrably gives improved privacy. And the, the old belief that authentication always implies lack of anonymity is not correct. And, and uh, one, more, one more issue, it was really a joy to, to, to fit the existing theory to, to this problem, kind of the glove was already, was already the, at least the initial glove already existed and suddenly the right hand popped up thereafter. And this, this can happen, and one should not uh, forget the existing, the existing uh, plethora of, of technologies that are available and, and, and adopt the right one. The example three that I'm going to give is stocking free tracking in Internet of Things. In the context of the Edison, pro Edison project or ephemeral ID project, it's a privacy solution for BLE devices, beacons, for the beacon ecosystem. And the design that has been uh, since 2015, and uh, this uh, Bluetooth. Uh, smart, which linked with uh, small devices, simple battery power, low energy hardware devices, uh, similar to Apple uh, Air. They, they, they transmit uh, BLE signals. They are easily installed uh, everywhere. And essentially, they are generic infrastructure to adapt them to things if you want to connect them to smartphone and then through that to the internet, through that gateways. And uh, these devices, they are tiny, they are broadcasting, so in this sense, they are like digital lighthouse that broadcasts in a certain uh, rate. It has some theoretical range. Uh, examples of such devices are Samsonite smart suitcase, Fitbit, Tile, and uh, other, other devices. And they, are, they can be a possible workhouse of some kind for the Internet of Things. Because what I just said, you have them in some way to a device, and then the device has suddenly 
computing life. This is the example of the Samsonite uh, suitcase. Oh. So it's real, it has, uh, it has a beacon. And uh, this is the canonical example that we worked with, beacon in a suitcase. And your phone, it, it's associated with your phone through an app. The phone scans regularly and identifies whether the suitcase is near you. Can alert you when you lose your luggage. Let's say the suitcase is not with you. It can alert you at the airport where the luggage reached the carousel coming, coming off the airplane. Another uh, case we wanted to support, though, is if the suitcase is lost and, and it went to another airport, for instance, or something like this, and then it, it, is, it cannot be next to the owner's phone. The, the, this beacon can only be near other phones. We wanted the user to get an alert to where is the baggage. And this is kind of a global signal from anywhere to the owner of the beacon anywhere. Of course, it's beacons that can be attached to things, so not to be neglected is also a need or a solution against abuse of beacons, which means I put, I put a beacon in your car I'm the owner, I'm using the global property, I will get signals and reports where you are. And of course, this is a major headache and it needs a solution as well. But uh, the first the first the first three bullets are how to how to cope, how to allow operation and the last one is how to prevent abuse and you have to and often with uh, solutions whether they are privacy solutions or other solutions you need to take care of both operation and anti-abuse and that, that's the connection if you look at the problem uh, as it was the fact that these devices broadcast. Uh, okay, encryption for security seems needed. Um, so you can always get it and locally decrypt it. But uh, point three, uh, the global, the remote reach, is out of range and gets you to you through uh, other phones. This seems problematic. And also, these beacons is, are battery powered and you need limited computing power. You, you don't want to waste uh, a lot of computation. So the situation in itself look, uh, look problematic. Nevertheless, we came up with a distant EID, ephemeral ID, an encrypted identifier that changes periodically in order to enhance privacy. And we need to take care of uh, its uh, security or privacy via cryptography. Hence the picture of Cloud Channel here. But we also need to hide or mask or randomize side channel by which different beacons uh, are different from each other. And hence the, the picture of Colombo over here. So uh, so what, what what did we do? We, you, you share you share the you share a key between the beacon and the owner, and then the beacon every once in a while. I will not get to all these details, but it starts to encrypt the time. Or the time window, 
and with this E, and therefore and send this as its, its, its identity. So the identity changes all the time, and it's called the femoral ID. And of course, we to encrypt the femoral ID, we have to change the MAC address of, of the, the beacon. It has a MAC address. We can we should uh, whenever we change the ID, we should change the MAC. And we should always encrypt the whatever the, the beacon sends, the telemetry data, and so on. And then these these are uh, pseudo random uh, functions essentially, and the collection of pseudo random functions uh, is uh, pseudo random. So this will be solved cryptographically. Uh, this problem. So what, what is this pseudo-random number good for? So locally, if you get this pseudo-random number that represents the ID, and the beacon is near you, and you are the sharing the key with the beacon, you can immediately recognize that this is your beacon. But for the global situation, like the suitcase that is, is lost in another uh, place, and another phone reads it, it cannot really decrypt it. So how do we do global from nearby mobiles to the owner through the cloud? Because the cloud needs to read it to the, to the user, so we need to change the architecture. And include the resolver in the cloud, the cloud server which employs the global reach of the cloud and its computing power as a trusted agent in a coordinated effort to allow to resolve and decipher the EID to the ID. So, so we essentially we essentially give uh, this capability to this agent, and, and, and then we can get, here is the beacon on the left side. It sends an EID. If it's yours, your app can get it, the nearby app. Otherwise, if it's not yours, you send to the cloud. Here, the cloud is on. This application is depicted as run, run by Google, but it can be run by Samsonite, for example. <coughs> and uh, and uh, then uh, you give, the, the, the owner gives Google the ability to decipher uh, ephemeral IDs, and then it can be resolved, and it can send you, it can send you the uh, the original beacon message. So no, this is a BLE, BLE message. Here it's run over IP and can be less encrypted. And uh, the resolver needs to route the signal to owner, this is problem one, and we enable it to, to get it. Uh, it doesn't need to know the info sent to the owner. So the info sent to the owner, the encryption, is done with a different cryptography that is not shared, is, which is never shared with the, with the resolver. The, 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 the least privilege principle hold here. We needed to add end-to-end -end from the beacon, but also the phone nearby the beacon also reports certain information like location. Uh, and we need a protocol between this phone and the owner phone without the owner and the phone never talking directly to each other. There is no interaction there. And Nevertheless, we wanted to have this channel and we sold it. This was done, this was for three. And finally, we need a trade-off between the remote beacon staying anonymous 
and the remote beacon potentially being uh, abused to report location of someone else, a rogue operation. And this solution, we the, there are solutions. Uh, they are under they are in, they are under uh, development in the sense that they have to be programmed. And we also, the last problem, we need to solve the statistical side channel of differences in times of transmission between the different beacons. Because statistical behavior may also violate privacy, the, the deviation, deviations in, 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 in time of transmission within the window may uh, uh, be a signature of uh, specific beacon, and we, want, we wanted to mask that. So we are, uh, there was five or six problems uh, to solve to make the privacy as high as we can and coping with uh, abuse. What is the secret sauce? You have to know that new systems always have gaps and you want to use cryptographic technologies, but it may not be enough. And you will need more analysis beyond the cryptography, beyond the just content uh, uh, protection. You, need, you may need architectural uh, extensions to, to help you. Uh, this may present uh, further privacy challenges. And always a uh, new protocol opens the door for new abuse. And you always have to go from the design to operational design to the anti-abuse prevention design when you design privacy. Because you add privacy for operation, you may increase the power of abuse. You have to cope with it. These are principles, and you have to deal with them. Uh, at the end, the gain new functionality is important. So imperfect I added privacy may be a goal due to various trade-offs. And uh, you need to find, to investigate the, the range of possibilities and uh, the perfect privacy sometimes is the enemy of the solid one. And here we really we have various problems. I didn't, I didn't get into all these problems. I just mentioned how to do ephemeral ID with cryptography. I didn't talk about the end-to-end -end from the beacon. I didn't talk about end-to-end -end from the uh, observer phone to, to, to the owner phone about how you do resolution, the various methods, and all together suddenly it becomes a, a system in which the, the, the right information is kept private from the right agents. Nobody, nobody learned, nobody can associate old beacons with new ones because they change ephemeral IDs and they cannot uh, and they don't have uh, statistical characteristics of time of sending and, 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 and typical side channels. You get end to end in the system, and uh, the, the cloud trusted resolver know how to route in spite of the encrypted ID. And you put all, all, all these together and all these requirements, and then you add potential abuse, when, when you are going to potentially uh, stop uh, worrying about privacy and start worrying about abuse and how you balance between the two, these are very important. So at the end, some solution with better privacy improves user experience and feeling and makes the system safer, but it will also take care of other things like uh, abuse 
and the function of this without without giving power to the trusted agent in the cloud we could never we could never hear about the global uh, suitcase that got lost and it is in another airport so we cannot locate it so um, i told you this started 2015 and still ongoing because info security is a process not a solution and so is privacy we are working on improved privacy all the time and on the right trade-offs and here this is what we have to learn from 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 this uh, this solution and also again things take things take time and uh, but we started very early. We started very early before before any deployment of uh, beacons uh, has been uh, already in the field. Okay. Uh, my example four is exposure notification using technology to help public health authority to fight COVID nineteen. I, uh, at the beginning, I wanted to give a more elaborate uh, protocol, but at the end, I, I settled for example four to be this due to some uh, um, conclusions that we can draw from it. And uh, it's important for, for the pets community, I think. Well, there was the pandemic. And we are technologists, and we are now in a world where we have smartphones that gave us online maps and services like Uber, mobile payments, and so on. What about health? And uh, on the CDC, the Center of Disease Control and Public Health Procedures, about pandemics, they were talking about contact tracing as an important uh, tool containing the, the pandemic. And we had the BLE project, I told you, it is from 2015. So we gained some possibilities, uh, some performance uh, uh, feasibilities and, 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 uh, and what BLE is capable of. And also, of course, other technologies that, that we examine for, for contact tracing, but, but in particular, BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy. And the question so is, was this, we have technologies, can they, not alone, but as another method in a bigger system. And not just can they help, can they help responsibly? We asked it in, in, in the company. Luckily for us, other companies and academia also, academic groups started to, and, and, and health authorities started to investigate the same question because apparently independently. And uh, it, was, it was very, very interesting uh, to all. And we all realized the humanity status, back to, to my, my starting point, that human, human activities and computing are getting together, hence privacy. We are at the, at a, at the time where what I call homo computatus, the, the computing man is becoming homo mobilis, the, the mobile phone man. And the question is, what is our ability at this stage? We have new computational model. We know that user data is handled with privacy, so privacy concern. We have utility. And what technology we want to use. And uh, some personal uh, realization for me throughout the project is, first of all, privacy is important. No need to give it up for each problem. If we start giving it up for this problem, then tomorrow there will be another problem. 
And then later on, when I, when I spoke with the, the academic group that dealt with the same problem, and people in Apple, people felt the same way. People felt the same way. Yet, it is not a pure privacy problem. It's not a pure crypto problem. It's not a pure security problem. There were numerous constraints to get a product that can help in contact tracing. The productization of the ideas is hard. You need to take care of performance, usability, battery. Let's take battery. Suppose you have a solution. It depletes your battery very fast. So you see that your phone that you, before you install the app that uh, helped you with the health, worked the whole day. Now, after two hours, you need to recharge the, the phone. If this happens, probably going to delete the app. And unless you live in a, in a, in a country where apps are mandatory, this will not work. Communication costs. Constraints, constraints of BAE has to be taken into account. Uh, usage, how how usability and usage, yes. and, and and penetration in the market uh, because it's important to, to the big portion of the population will will use the the app to to be effective, and how the server operates. And, and, and the, the development, development time of this, if, if the, the pandemic, pandemic lasts two and a half years and development of the new product takes five years, it's not going to help much. And of course, privacy, security, and safety also has to be taken into, have to be taken into account. And these are all detailed technical issues. I, I just gave you the battery example. And constraints are interrelated, interwined, interwined, and again, we'll see a trade of it. And you need to run feasibility on this, including security and privacy, threat, and so on. You need to check various designs and see what are the problems in principle. And someone's great idea may sit in an awkward place on a trade off curve. Whenever you're deciding to come up with a product which is in a trade-off, there's no not obvious, you know, there's not an obvious optimal solution. Opinions vary, and you have to make your best estimates of all the constraints. And I listed here a lot of constraints, not all of them, but a lot of them. And you have to decide where to be prepared. You need feasibility study, which includes the privacy, but not in isolation. This is very important. Okay? Privacy does not live alone. You have to confront it with this system function, the spec, with its performance uh, and usability, implementability, and uh, trust in the issues. And here is the point, much as I advocated before privacy by design, I want to refine this principle and say that it's privacy but by design, but not designed by privacy. Sometimes we have a tendency to follow a scientific paper about privacy and drive the design for me. It will be great, but it may not be the right solution. It's because it will be designed by privacy, where we have many, many concerns. So, uh, what happened in the project? We explored various technologies, numerous BLE designs. So before BLE, we also, we also examined uh, other technology, but then we settled on BLE due to its 
accuracy, better accuracy. But we this, we looked at it from pure privacy. For example, I did privacy preserving uh, contact tracing based on joint compute. What else? And uh, more more complete versions appear by other people. But but I did it just see the price, and uh, we did design based on uh, ephemeral IDs, only reveal IDs of infected people, revealing hash of IDs and so on, or keys and so on. This uh, one alternative was to reveal the encryption key of the day, which gives you the most compression to to if you work a solution based on ephemeral ID, if you give the key, you can regenerate the ephemeral IDs. But from a privacy point of view, we can connect IDs in the day. Uh, and this is a trade-off. You can connect them. You can uh, understand that the same person found in one time is in another time, the same person. This, at the end, became the Google Apple Explorer notification after, after much work by the companies, by academia, many engineers in many areas. <laughs> the ephemeral ID envisioned as a layer for uh, privacy is the key point in this design. The protocol is very simple. <clears throat> Have a key, have a random key for the day, in 10 minutes, derive the next essentially ephemeral ID and broadcast it. Scan and read other IDs around you, and that's it. That's what you do. If you are infected, you need to report, upload the 14 keys of the last 14 days that you had. And every day, download all published keys and check for exposure against all uh, 144 daily IDs from each of those keys. <clears throat> and then uh, you get uh, how much exposure you had to these uh, IDs and for how long to reduce epidemiologically whether you have been exposed. And then, based on this, your phone is making the locally the determination. And this is combined with other procedures in the real world. The health authority to run the app for you uh, determine. And that's it. So the, so the, the blue thing here is the API provided by the smartphone companies, and it was realized early on that it doesn't matter if you have iPhone or Android, smartphones is a smartphone, and you want to work together for the common good. And, and uh, then on the phone, it will be determined your cell exposure. All right, so this is a simple protocol. And then, when the protocol uh, got published, the protocol got numerous criticisms from cryptographers who came out with many attacks regarding privacy violation. And, and it was good to, you know, I'm not, I'm not against scrutiny. In fact, I am pro scrutiny, and it's important that this, this were done. Yet. A principle that I already mentioned about architectures and cryptography. Cryptography is a layer, and there are many other protective layers. <clears throat> the Gaian protocol, in fact, does not run in the user space at all, but at the system space, as, as other Manet's protocol that, are, that you don't want the, the, the automatic. Uh, uh, 
network protocol to be based on, on the user wishes. So you put it on the system level, not, not at the user control. And then if the user tries to jailbreak the phone and, and, and interfere with the protocol, then the anti-abuse layer of, 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 the, of the system space will interfere and will prevent it or detect. That's one thing. When I discuss those cryptographic attacks, I, I, I never refer to, 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 to the fact that it's not just the cryptography. There are the layers that are helping it. You put it in the right place in the architecture. It's very important to locate things in the right place. Also, what attacks are done at a reasonable cost to the attacker is an important issue. This is the, the core of risk analysis. Not worst case attack like cryptography uh, is doing. If, if, I can, uh, if I can find five people who are sick and their identities, is it worth that I will pay $100,000 for it? If I can fool 10 people to stay at home when they don't need to stay at home, does it worth 200,000 people for me? It's not like ransomware when you know, I attack something and I know I'm going to demand a certain amount of money, also done by the risk analysis of the attacker in order to assure that it gets the money then it has, it has the, the right incentive to mount this attack for the right cost. And the secret sauce in this is they use cryptography as part of multiple security technologies, not as a single uh, layer. Physical security and hardware security modules can be employed. And the joint system together is the privacy enhancing technology. It's not just the protocol, it's not just the software layer, it's not just the algorithm. The algorithm is very simple, but designing the system, what to put what, all the other smartness and anti abuse that there is already in the architecture and exploiting them for the sake of giving enhanced privacy is important. You have to view it this way. It's very nice to have nice personal protocols. However, it is important to come up with system. And when you come up with system, you use all your resources. At the end, I did security analysis and exploration of the problem. So when apps were running, I teamed up with uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech team, based team, to do actual analysis of the phone with the uh, usual projects that is done in academia with students that are going to try to break phones, look at phones, and do it. And, uh, and, and essentially, in, in this analysis that was published uh, by an IEEE computer this year, we realized it is private to all but very extreme and costly attacks. And risk analysis techniques approves this choice of running the protocol where it runs and running these protocols. And also, two years or so running, no attack in, was noticed in practice. At least it was not noticed. And uh, And uh, this, this is this is one thing, thing and this is this is due to this secret source of use cryptography as part of multi multiple security technologies. In 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 a paper you probably want to write a paper about a, 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 a nice protocol. In a system you want to add security measures to your protocol to cope up with uh, added uh, risks to the running environment of the protocol. So this is essentially what, what we found and we, we published. And it, it, was good, it was good to have the, the attacks, it was good to have the scrutiny, but it was also good to have uh, an evaluation of existing apps, existing phone, phones, Apple and Google, 
and investigate uh, the risk in the real on, on, on actual system, on, on the actual systems. So that's one thing. Second thing, further, uh, for secure analytic uh, of the apps as a whole, Researchers and engineers in Google and Apple built on uh, the prior system, the ENPA, the Exposure Notification Private Analytics. It was presented by, by Mariana Reikla from our team in Real World Crypto this year to allow private computing by not revealing individual data, provided that the two uh, servers performing this uh, private computing are not collaborating. It shows that for the common good purpose, one could find independent servers to perform MPC and to be trusted. And the secret sauce is, is have a system with privacy. And when you need to add more computing on top of it, don't give up the privacy. Instead, build a private procedure on top of it, kind of modularly build privacy enhancing technology matching the, the privacy level. And this, this is how it done. Users were contributing to Modi. I'm terribly, yes. so, I'm terribly sorry, but uh, uh, we need to come to so, sort of a conclusion relatively soon uh, yes, because I think people have lots of questions and we only oh, have like five more minutes. Okay, so yes, so anyway, this was done. And let me conclude and say there is a need. Rest assured there is a need for modern cryptographic uh, technologies for privacy, namely PES. It may come up in various systems and business and do other, due to other constraints like legal and so on. Uh, if you want to deploy cryptographic, advanced cryptography, PET protocol, you have to explore it in this context. And usually it's initial customized technologies like join and compute. If it's done right, uh, uh, then it will it, it can gain momentum and be used elsewhere. It is quite rewarding to be involved in specifying, designing, and deploying of this. This is happening industry wide now. Uh, it's always starting small, having books for extension, and then you can do it. I gave a few takeaways that you better uh, take it into your heart. You, if if you want to rely on my word and my experience, of course you can. You can develop your own. Uh, it's very important that the leading company now recognize uh, this. PES was a, a really a pioneering uh, forum in this area. Uh, and, 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 and finally, in many situations, adding privacy allows one to perform more computation under constraint and with respect to user, because otherwise it cannot be done. Hence, I would finish by saying that privacy technology is like car brakes. Brakes were originally introduced to allow cars, not to allow cars to stop, but to allow them to accelerate and speed up, and then stop safely, nevertheless. Before, before brakes, 30 miles, 25 or, or something miles per hour were the speed limit for cars. And privacy has the same effect. It seems like it's, it's blocking you, but it's, it allows you more computing. So thank you very much. That was a very nice conclusion. Thank you. OK, so I wrote down six or seven